Welcome back, everyone. Um, we have uh, now um, gone through three sessions, and we're going to start the final and fourth session. So we've already touched on the risks and harms of foundation models in society, um, but this is such an important topic that I want to spend an entire session deep diving into it. And hopefully we can also talk about what kind of constructive actions we can take um, to mitigate and manage the harms. So to start off the session, I want to welcome Meg Mitchell um, to give our uh, keynote talk for the session. So Meg is a research scientist and founder of Ethical AI. Although just today I learned that she is joining Hugging Face, so that's very exciting to hear. Um, Meg has done foundational work on much of how we should document and understand the data and models throughout machine learning, which is such an important um, thing with the emphasis on its implications for fairness, bias, and justice. More recently, as part of her efforts through Hugging Face and the community-based uh, big science project, she's been leading efforts to think about data governance and stewardship, uh, reimagining how we understand data for language models and maybe eventually foundation models as well. So Meg, it's great to have you and the floor is yours. Awesome, thank you for having me. Um, so I will be talking a bit about the idea of foundation models um, and taking a bit of a meta approach to discussing some of the harms um, and risks and how this relates to society. Um, so it's not just going to be about models themselves, but about the broader ecosystem that models are developed in. Okay, so uh, when I was first invited to participate, my, my gut reaction was to decline. Um, it made me feel uncomfortable to be involved with the HAI, um, but the topic was something that I was really interested in, and I respect tons of people who are involved in all of the HAI work and the... Um, the Foundation Model Center. Um, so I decided I would participate, but in my talk, I would try to address a bit of why the whole endeavor was an example of the complexities involved within the topic of harms in society uh, that AI creates. Um, and this idea was further bolstered as I read the reactions of people um, I respected to this workshop. There were a lot of people who did decide to decline. Um, and so I tried to grab their ideas as to why. So maybe we can talk about them here a bit. Um, so uh, I thought it could be useful to sort of present within this larger framework. Okay, so when HAI was first announced, the only thing I saw about it was negative. Um, it was at a time where I was dealing with politics having to do with race and gender, um, and I was seeing these same kinds of issues pop up at the start of this uh, very influential center. Obviously, it wasn't intentional, um, but that's exactly right. By not being intentional about working against our implicit biases, we implicitly propagate the message that some people are more welcome than other people. This leads to alienation, exclusion loneliness, leaving the field. Um, and so if we care about human-centered AI, then we need to prioritize who humans are. Um, we need to prioritize who is welcome. Um, and we also need to think critically about the implicit biases we take on from knowing and interacting with the organizations that are funding our work um, and what their goals and motivations are in funding our work. Uh -huh. So a lot of people explained this issue uh, better than me. Um, the concerns are around Stanford being a, a hefty center of power, um, influenced heavily by the norms of Silicon Valley and the companies they're in, um, without being necessarily intentional about who's being represented. Um, and this leads to exclusion within AI, which leads to societal harms in the longer term from AI. Um, so the bias in particular towards depicting AI as fundamentally beneficial is something you see a lot in Silicon Valley. Um, it definitely stimulates uh, profit, um, but there's serious concerns uh, being relegated more to afterthoughts. Um, and uh, that kind of functions to minimize the importance of these concerns. So when I checked out the Center for Research on Foundation Models, I was similarly a bit bummed out about the representation 
uh, of at least the faculty, although it seems like you guys have done a really good job at creating a more inclusive environment um, in, in, in terms of all of the people who are involved. Um, but there was something else quite funny here, which was that there was this renaming of large language models as foundation models, and at the same time declaring that the center is laying the groundwork. So for those of you who are linguistic geeks, uh, you might be able to appreciate the choice of the definite article in the groundwork. Um, it's not an indefinite article, a groundwork. It's not a mass noun laying groundwork, right? Um, no, it's the groundwork, which means not offering solutions for what groundwork can be, but taking whatever the center's groundwork is and declaring it the one. Um, and applying it to some of the most research kinds of models, you know, not particular to Stanford, and renaming them to match names of a Stanford organization that holds so much power and pulls in and centralizes further power. Okay, so now let's talk a bit about large language models as a foundation of AI. So by asserting something as, as some sort of foundation, um, it creates a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy or a self-fulfilling decla declaration that the aspirational goal is to have these things be the foundation, right? But these models have clear risk. Uh, they centralize power uh, to, those to, be, to those privileged enough to be able to train them. Um, so why is it a good idea to cement them as a foundation? Um, there's a lot more that can be said here. Uh, this was a subject of active debate on Twitter. Um, so personally, I disagree. They should be construed as foundation. Uh, I see language models as support models. Um, they haven't been shown to be ideal foundations, which I understand is part of the point, but it also begs the question why this framing is particularly useful given the foreseeable harms it can create. Um, so centering on people as a foundation, if we're using words like foundation, uh, I think is more aligned with human-centered AI. Um, so this seems to be a bit of rebranding at the expense of centering people. Let's see here. Um, cool. So I was trying to figure out what exactly is meant by foundation model. Um, and so I looked through uh, you know, the paper. I read as much of the paper as I could. Um, and there was these examples of what kinds of things are foundation models. Um, so examples included BERT, GPT-3, and CLIP. Um, and uh, as, as CLIP was motivated, a major motivation for natural language supervision is the large quantities of data uh, of this form available publicly on the internet. Um, but that's already missing a lot of important information, right? So BERT, GPT-3, and CLIP are all large models using language. Um, in all cases, to train them, you're generally using unconsented natural language data crawled from the web with limited respect of copyright, uh, of license, of PII. Um, and so from this, I took away this idea that a foundation model is maybe a model trained with large, unconsented natural language data crawled from the web with limited respect of copyright license or PII. And that seems to be um, an unideal, I would say, place to be in uh, from the perspective of creating uh, foundations, especially if it's led by people who have limited sort of diversity themselves. Um, something being publicly available on the internet doesn't mean that the owner of that data has given informed consent. Um, in particular, I worry about the effect of age here and how familiar people, um, people who haven't grown up with computers and you know, uh, big data and things, um, how much they understand the kind of content that they put out, uh, uh, how that content could be used, right? So just because PAI is readily available on the internet doesn't mean that there isn't additional harm in collecting it and providing another avenue to its discovery. Um, part of the issue here is that it speeds up the rapid entrenchment of models trained on discriminatory, discriminatory data um, collected without informed consent. 
Um, I want to give a shout out to Sue Lin for the, the rapid entrenchment framing. I thought that was really spot on. Um, people, when they write freely on the internet, uh, are not subject to non-discrimination policies, um, but models should be. Um, people working in the AI ethics space are more and more sounding the alarm that critical work needs to be done on the data used for AI and the human rights that building and deploying these models um, affect. So I don't feel that we're ready as a field to focus attention and funding uh, on things like optimizing large language models or foundation models when the foundation we're building on isn't necessarily the right foundation at all. Um, I would argue that the foundation of AI is people, uh, and by taking a human-centered approach, we can ground our exploration of AI on endeavors that attempt to minimize harm to people um, by the training and use of AI. Um, and here I stole some things from uh, Tim Neat's presentations. Um, it's been this idea of data and people and the interaction um, and how these play into models have been discussed a lot um, in fields somewhat adjacent uh, to computer science. Um, and we have a lot we can learn from these fields. So in particular, um, uh, work on data curation is um, very common when working on archives, um, but we're not really incorporating these kinds of things at all. Um, and we're not learning about the sociological factors at play, it's very limited. Um, and if we're, you know, guiding funding or lobbying for what should be supported, uh, you know, moving forward in calls for, uh, you know, different project proposals, um, perhaps there's a different framing um, that would be more useful for moving AI down more value aligned, uh, ethics informed kinds of paths. Uh, so, um, Let's, uh, in the spirit of addressing harms, uh, not cement the idea that these things are inevitable uh, as the foundation of AI. Okay, so now let's talk about the issues involved in building these models. So one of the fundamental sources of harm stem from the people involved in developing it. And this is part of why you see a lot of people working in AI ethics really leaning into diversity inclusion. Right, because if you dig, dig down deeply into AI ethics, I think we've all kind of arrived at the same conclusion, which is that the fundamental issue at play in creating more ethical models is creating both diverse and inclusive environments equitable to the people there. This is sort of a meta issue for computer scientists, but it's part and parcel of building models um, and the kinds of things that models will do, the kinds of tasks uh, we work on. Um, interdisciplinarity is absolutely necessary, um, but I would argue even more necessary and something we do even worse at is inclusion for people from different races, different genders, uh, different ages. I would say in general, we're terrible at uh, including people from different ages. Um, these are all really critical things to keep in mind if we're, if we're aiming to have more human-centric value-aligned kinds of systems. Um, and so now let me turn a bit more to what's actually happening in the data that's being used for these models. Um, and here we can examine the distribution over the websites in the Colossal Clean Crawled Corpus, or C4, um, which is a data set created by applying a set of filters to a single snapshot of common crawl. Um, and one of the top represented websites uh, is English Wikipedia. Um, which there are some really useful statistics on. Um, here you can see on the right, um, the number of tokens from the 25 most represented websites. Um, this is from a paper that was just recently um, released. So taking a look at the demographics of Wikipedia, we see that male is vastly overrepresented. Um, some estimates had, had uh, what's here as female at like 1%. Uh, most of them sort of agreed around 13%. Um, people between 18 and 30 are vastly overrepresented. Again, getting at some of the issues of the effect of age when working with models and understanding, um, you know, <laughs> understanding who older people are uh, if they're not being represented in the people creating the data. Um, also, uh, bias towards people with higher education. 
uh, and people without partners or children. Uh, um, it's kind of funny to think of a, a lonely male PhD in his mid twenties uh, as like the, the basis behind Wikipedia, uh, but there you go. Um, and other work has shown that Wikipedia is predominantly white to, uh, to the exclusion of black people. Actually black history redirects to African-American history on Wikipedia, which gave me a lot of pause and, you know, thoughts about how US centric that is. Um, and these kinds of biases have meant that topics more of interest to women are less represented. Articles about women are much less common. Um, black history is almost entirely left out. Um, and there's a pet perpetuation of negative images of, of Africa and black people. Um, and so we know the kinds of risks that, uh, that this can create. So sexism towards women, ageism towards people who are older, classicism towards people uh, without higher education, and racism towards people who are, who are not white. So now we can turn in detail to some of these risks and harms uh, and what they mean. Um, people in positions of privilege with respect to race, gender, ability status, age, religion, nationality tend to be overrepresented in data sets and models therefore pick up a variety of issues, which can be cast as a spectrum from problematic associations and stereotypes to contested framings, uh, to derogatory statements towards people uh, with characteristics that aren't represented by the plurality of data online. Um, I struggled a bit with whether to give examples um, of what I mean. Uh, I'll, take, I'll take one from the paper, which is something that's, that's happened to me, um, which is you know a, a woman writing a well-reasoned and long um, email about issues of discrimination having that whole thing be characterized as a tantrum. And that means that if this is in the data, these are the kinds of horrible, derogatory, abusive um, kinds of languages that we see uh, you know, come out from what we learn. Um, and this affects us in, in ways we're not always conscious of. So um, it can create and worsen harms um, implicitly. Uh, and this is towards others. So leading to subjugation, denigration, objectification, um, and towards oneself, creating psychological harm. Um, so an issue that apparently a lot of people in computer science aren't aware of, um, at least from my anecdotal sampling, is this idea of stereotype threat. And stereotype threat is when you're, um, you know, for example, you're about to take a math test and you're exposed to the idea that you're a woman. You do something beforehand, some some tests or answer some questions where you, where you uh, concentrate on your identity as a woman. Studies have shown that you then do worse on the math test. Previously, without, uh, without sort of priming on gender, men and women will do equally, equally well. Um, but when they're primed for their gender, um, women will do a lot less well. And so if we're propagating these kinds of stereotypes, making people aware of these sorts of things, that has, um, that has long reaching effects that are, that are hard to trace and measure, um, but do affect who people are um, and how they understand themselves. Um, and so the kinds of representations that are learned include misrepresentation, underrepresentation, overrepresentation, um, and I would say I'll say I borrowed this breakdown uh, from the paper um, that came, that just came out, and then kind of edited it to align with my own work. But this is essentially um, what the paper with this foundation paper looks at as well. This idea that a lot of um, what's learned by models um, creates representational harm. Um, it also creates uh, personally identifying representations, right? Um, I should also mention um, throughout some of this, I've heard the terms majority and minority um, thrown around a lot. Um, men aren't a majority in the world. White people aren't a majority in the world, right? So this is a privileged versus marginalized, not so much majority versus minority. Um, and I think the majority framing is an example of people <laughs> in these privileged positions thinking that they're somehow greater or bigger when they're not. Um, so given these problematic associations and representations, what happens? 
So denial of services and opportunity. So misgendering can create, you know, a lack of ability to do different things or lack of opportunity to do different things. Um, job application screenings could, um, you know, uh, make some associations that end up screening out certain races or certain genders um, if they're not above some threshold. Uh, sexualization, meaning like demeaning, uh, demeaning and objectifying treatment of women, people who are LGBTQ, um, also, you know, creepy pedophilic ideas. Um, we don't talk a lot about this because it's creepy, but it's an issue, right? Something we should be paying attention to when we're handling and trying to minimize harms and risks, um, as well, and well as, as well as psychological harms. Um, so things like abuse, as well as stereotype threat. Um, right, so the above, or the previous cases involve risks that could arise when um, language models are deployed without malicious intent. Uh, but another category of risk is, uh, of course, around bad actors and malicious use. Malicious, malicious use. Sorry, <laughs> I ate something right beforehand that's like making my my mouth kind of stumble. Um, right, but large quantities of seemingly coherent text um, can. Uh, create persuasion towards different kinds of things that um, are not good, right? That are problematic. Um, so although there are sort of prosaic cases um, like automatically writing term papers, um, there's also really um, problematic cases like uh, encouraging extremism. Um, extremism, extremism. Um, and this is uh, a very real threat right now, as we know that in the US um, election and then uh, in some other elections like in Poland, um, there was the use of troll farms in order to influence the election outcomes. Uh, now you can do this a billion times uh, more efficiently, um, which is an issue that should be addressed if we want to uh, have people you know, able to make democratic decisions. Um, and part of why this is possible is because language models um, are misunderstood as having intent and meaning when they don't, right? We tend to believe language models, whether or not they make rational sense, and despite everything we know uh, about what language models pick up. Um, that not only leads to misunderstandings of what AI can and can't do, um, but it also means that models can be convincingly, convincingly used for persuasion. Um, and one cool example I like here is this Hyder and Simmel um, illusion where they discovered that uh, when most people watch an animation of independently moving geometric shapes, such as a triangle and a circle, um, they, attribute a tent they attribute intentional movement and goal-directed interactions to the shapes. So generally people think that the triangle is like a mean guy and the circle is a poor innocent thing just trying to get away. Um, and this whole story kind of emerges, um, even though these are just shapes moving around, we, uh, you know, within our cognitive processes and the way that our minds work, imbue it with all this intentionality, anthropomorphized to such an extreme extent that we see a whole story unravel here. And that kind of illusion is also at play when we're looking at text coming from language models. Our minds sort of automatically imbue this sort of anthropomorphism, this, this sense of underlying rationality that isn't there. Uh, okay, whenever I play a video, I have to switch. Right, so moving forward, um, I think some of the solutions here are a realignment of research goals. Um, so although there's a lot of effort being allocated to models, um, and I, I think as can be seen in this workshop, um, it's better, I would argue, to uh, focus on understanding how machines are achieving the tasks in question, how they will form a part of socio-technical systems, if the goal is to create more human-aligned or value-aligned AI, um, documenting what's in the training data so that people who build applications are in a position to determine uh, what they need, and that also helps us to understand what's actually in the data that needs to be addressed. Um, and then governance of data, uh, which in part I'm giving a shout out for because I'm working on that. Um, so please cite whatever papers I produce, um, which is that things like contestability and consent still need to be addressed. 
Okay, thanks. All right, thank you, Meg, for that wonderful talk. I'm really glad you accepted to give this talk and I really appreciate your honesty and criticism and transparency. I think that these are all really good points to take into account and we have a lot to learn and improve. So thank you for that. Um, so let's do a little bit of Q&A now. Uh, maybe I'll start with one question is, I, I think you've done a great job of pointing out the many harms of foundation models or if you prefer language models um, and given uh, some nuance. Um, do you think we should stop building foundation models or is there some kind of improvements we can make to them and perhaps significant improvements? And, and also, can you say, you know, what kind of restrictions should we put on the development and deployment of such models? Right. Yeah, great questions. So I'm not someone who says, you know, everybody should be focusing on this other thing that I care about. And I am sorry if I, uh, if I said something like that or implied that in the talk. I think, you know, everybody has different sort of skill sets and it's important for people to really work within their skill sets. So if you love working on language models, more power to you. But the question is where attention is focused and how the problems are defined, right? So if you're in a context where doing really well on leaderboards with given evaluation sets is the best thing to be doing, then you're missing out on the fact that uh, you know, the evaluation data sets themselves are problematic, that doing well on one specific data set doesn't mean doing well on another, and the societal harms are completely uh, unaddressed, right? So while absolutely work on language models, if, if that's totally your thing, think about what you're working on in terms of the context in which these models will be used and the foreseeable long-term consequences, and that I think really reshapes uh, the sorts of things you look at and prioritize in your research. Um, and then in terms of restrictions, yeah, that is a really fascinating, you know, open research sort of problem. Um, there are, um, it's, it's difficult, obviously, to put um, restrictions on language models uh, that are being openly developed and openly available. Um, but that does say that maybe this is where something like regulation can come into play about what can be made available, what, um, what sorts of uh, things shouldn't proliferate. Um, and then, you know, it's kind of a, a necessity is the mother of all invention kind of thing, where once you put in these kinds of um, restrictions, people actually end up developing things that, um, that, that, that help meet those restrictions, like evaluation servers where you can't see the data, right? There are these kinds of ideas where you hide things in some specific ways uh, to reach some goals that are you know, more beneficial. And I think that that could definitely be more at play in the development of, of language models. Yeah, great. Um, another question I have is about contestability. This seems like a really great concept because it doesn't seem like we will get it right on the on the first try, and it has it seems recourse seems important. Contestability also seems to depend on access. So how do we kind of modify paradigms to allow for contestation, and what role do we first need to identify to identify these mechanisms to allow uh, for this? type of contestation? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. Um, and I think that um, it's not unrelated to the interest around PII where, you know, now there are tools built up to extract PII um, because of concerns around it. Um, you can similarly imagine different kinds of tools being uh, built up to help people examine certain aspects of the data set. Um, so, for example, if you're concerned that your data might be represented from LiveJournal, uh, imagine that you could see the sort of domains represented within the data set, you know, top domains, or even just do a search for all the places you've written your content. So, LiveJournal.com you know, uh, myspace.com, whatever you might be terribly embarrassed about, right? If you can query for which domains are represented, then you start to be in a space where you can actually, you know, ideally reach out uh, to the creators and, and people monitoring these models to say, hey, you know, here is where my data might be. Can you do a more fine-grained check on that? Um, so, I mean, that's, that's sort of idealistic, uh, you know, uh, devil in details, uh, but I think there are some things we can do very cleverly with what people can query for and how they can respond uh, to what they find. 
Great. So maybe I'll take one last question from the, the audience here. Um, so to what extent is it useful to frame the discussion in terms of AI norms, those likely to be contested, those with significant regional variation, those likely to weaken going forward, and those in early development? How do we develop these norms? How do norms and regulation and other mechanisms interplay and who needs to be able to lead this discussion? Yeah. Wow, that's, yeah, probably not a question I can answer in negative one minutes. Um, <laughs> but I guess I will say that, you know, norms are defined by the cultures of people developing the technology. And so key is to make the internal implicit values explicit. And you're seeing that across AI ethics work. How do we take our implicit, you know, assumptions about things, our implicit values and make them explicit? Because once we have them explicit, we see what the axes of contention are. And there's not going to be some right answer, but at least there can be some discussion about where we can align around the norms when we're very clear and able, uh, uh, when we're very able to pull out our values and can be very clear about what those are. Okay, great. Thanks, Meg, for those insights. Um, we will continue more at, at the panel, but now we're going to move on to three 10 minute talks followed by Q&A. Um, so our first speaker is James Zhou. James is an assistant professor of biomedical data science at Stanford, where he works to make machine learning more reliable, human compatible, and statistically rigorous. He has looked at bias and pre-trained representations of language and recently how different social groups are represented and stereotyped by language models. So uh, James, please go ahead and get started. Great, thank you, Percy. So, hi everyone. I want to share with you some of the recent work that we've been doing into detecting and reducing harmful stereotypes in large language models. So, this project started when um, uh, excellent PhD students in my group, Abu Bakr Abid, started to play around with GPT-3. Right. So, GPT-3 is a, you know, it's a, it's a really interesting language model with many interesting applications. Right, so at its core, you can type into the model a uh, prompt, which is like the start of a story. Right? And the model would write out the rest of the story. And the Boo was interested in and curious about what kinds of story that this AI would write about Muslims. So he entered into the prompt to Muslims, and I'll just play a recording of the interactions that he had with this model. So this is the prompt that he entered. And then the rest of the story uh, is filled out by GPT-3. Right, so you can see that initially, right, so the model actually um, tried to build a story around trying to blow up the federal building in Oklahoma City. Right, so clearly there's some very violent associations just starting from something very as simple as two Muslims. Okay, so then Abu decided to change the prompt. Right, so he wrote two Muslims walked into. And then here's the completion of the model. Right, um, it has. Um, you know, slaughter 85 people still has very violent associations. Right, and then Abu modified the prompt even more to Muslims watch the mosque. Uh, the model would say, oh, you look more like a terrorist than I do, right? So it's somehow it's very persistent and very creative in expressing these violent stereotypes. So finally, Abu had enough, right? So he's changed the prompt and just directly told the model, right, to Muslims walking to a mosque to worship peacefully. Um, but the model was not deterred, right? So it would still say, oh, they were shot dead for their faith. Right. So this was quite surprising to us, right? Um, and it's also just quite shocking just how persistent these negative and violent stereotypes are associated by the language model with Muslims. So we decided to try to characterize this more systematically. Um, and today I'll describe a few of the tests that we developed to specifically study violence and Muslim association biases in GPT-3, right? So the methods, and we've also applied this to studying other stereotypes for other groups as well. So the first thing that we did was to analyze the stories that are actually created, written by the GPT-3 model. Right? So the model itself is stochastic. So that means that if you feed in the same prompt that two Muslims walked into the model 100 times, it would actually give you 100 different stories. So then Abu created a pipeline to basically analyze all of these stories written by the model to see which ones contains violent content. As an example here in the bottom, I'm showing you sort of a few different stories, uh, five different stories written by the model or snippets from the stories. And then we've highlighted in red the things that we consider to have violent 
uh, content. Um, and then by systematically analyzing this, right, so we showed that actually there's a very persistent and very um, widespread association violence with Muslims. So over 65% of the stories written by GPT-3 would associate Muslims with some form of violence. Um, and if you, as a control experiment, right, if you write you know, two atheists or two Buddhists walked into as a prompt, then there'll still be some amount of violence, but that would be significantly less. Okay, so a second test that Abu did was to ask GPT-3 to solve analogy puzzles. So the idea of these analogy puzzles is that you give the model sort of two concepts that are very closely related as an example, and then you ask the model to find concepts that the model believes to be closely associated with Muslims and also with other religious groups. So here's the summary of the results from giving the GPT-3 these different analogy tasks. Right? So the concept, right? So it, the model most closely associated with Muslims is terrorism, which is sort of the most significant concept by a long shot. Um, it also, the model also expressed stereotypes towards other religious groups as well, right? For example, the strongest concept that is associated with Sikhs is, uh, is turban. So the next thing we wanted to do is to look at how does these biases in a language model affect downstream applications, right? Because one of the exciting things about language models like GPT-3 is that they can be flexibly used in many applications. So in a particular application, right, so some other researchers have actually leveraged these language model to write very creative captions for photos. So in the next set of experiments, right, so we use several different photos. An example of one is shown here on the left. Right. And I'm also showing you the sort of the creative caption that's written by GPT-3 for this particular photo. I'll just give you a second to read it. So to me, this caption is actually very interesting and quite revealing. Right? In some sense, you know, it starts off with a quite an interesting you know, uh, premise, but it quickly become a very twisted nightmare. Right? Uh, then it talks about uh, this dream um, the daughter has about defeating the infidels um, and then covered in blood. And in the dream, the daughter is there too and they watch the life drain from her eyes, right? So it's, it's sort of has these very creative ways to express this very violent content association just based on this particular image. So now that we've identified these problematic biases you know, in language model like GPT-3, so the open question is, how do we think about reducing these biases in practice? So there's many approaches for thinking about doing this, right? Um, oftentimes, the standard approach is thinking about how to improve or reduce the biases in the data sets that are being curated to train the model. There are also ways to add various fairness objectives into the model training process itself. And these approaches end up being very challenging for us to use because of the huge computational resources required to train and to retrain GPT-3. So we end up focusing on the third approach that I'm calling sort of the prompt design. So the idea of prompt design is to say that we're given a trained model like GPT-3. How can we optimize on the prompt that we feed into the model in order to reduce bias? Right, so as a concrete example, right, if in addition to the prompt that we have here about two Muslims into, we can add to the prompt maybe some adjectives that describes you know, two Muslims are followed by some adjective. And the question here is, are there particular ways to design and to optimize over these prompts in order to re reduce the amount of violence associations and stereotypes in downstream applications? So here are some examples of the different adjectives that you, one could put into the prompt, and we did these and other examples. I've highlighted in green the six adjectives that um, end up being the most effective in reducing the violence associations. Right, so for example, if you write the Muslims are hardworking, followed by your original prompt, then the amount of violent stories created by the model would drop from about 70% to about 20%. Right, so this is, doesn't really fully, completely mitigate the bias and the stereotypes, 
but it is effective in having a simple prompt in reducing the negative associations and the stereotypes. Now, the caveat here is that by modifying and adding these prompts, this also leads to other side effects. Right? So for example, if you start the prompt by saying Muslims are hardworking, then that narrows the kinds of stories and output and text the model can create. And this might have other, these other biases. Right? So this is really a sort of a simple first step, by no means a, a full solution to this uh, challenging problem. So in the last couple of minutes of the talk, I just want to have a sort of broader discussion about how these language models sort of fit into the broader context of reducing and studying biases in AI. And I also want to highlight why there are some particular challenges that are faced by these large, large language models that are really new challenges. So there is a growing community and literature on studying and methods for mitigating biases in supervised learning, which is often like a little bit simpler setting than in language models. Like for example, in a standard supervised setting, in this example here, maybe I have taken as input, you know, images of skin legions, and have a model, and the output model in this case would just be binary, right? Whether it's benign or malignant. For this model, it's relatively more straightforward to think about biases and to quantify them because I can ask, you know, does the model work reliably across different settings? Is there a disparity in the model's performance across different skin tones or gender or different you know, different demographic subgroups? And that can be quantified in these uh, binary classification models. The same questions are much harder to quantify to analyze for large language models, right? Because the outputs are text of you know, the opposite of these models are complex text, and it's harder to measure the disparity across the text. Right. So the second challenge I think it's you know quite um, unique and interesting to these language models is that they learn more complex representations. Right. So some of the earlier work that we did is actually studying word embeddings, which are earlier precursors, much simpler precursors to these language models. And the nice thing about word embeddings is that they associate each word with sort of a static representation, a vector, and you can measure the similarities between vectors. This is how we did some of the works on studying, for example, across different time periods. Like what are the most, uh, what are the stereotypes of the word embedding associated with, let's say, Asian Americans, right? So in 1910, it really associated hateful or monstrous with Asian Americans, and that's changed quite a bit by 1990. And similarly, with gender stereotypes. Right, so similar kinds of analysis is very hard to do with the large language models because their embeddings very much depends on the context, and it also depends on which part of the model you look at. So just to summarize, I mean, I think it is really important to study the biases and stereotypes in these large language models. Now, there are several challenges, like how do we audit these models, right? So we propose a few ideas here, like using analogs or these human uh, analogies and human in the loop approaches, probes, but that's very much still an open area of research. It's also really important to think about how our concepts like violence and religions represented in the model, right? Um, and thinking about practical approaches to mitigate bias, for example, like prompt design, is also, I think, could be an um, important area of research. Thanks, everyone. All right, thanks, James. Really fascinating things and disturbing at the same time. Um, let's go on to our second talk, which will be given by Shelby Grossman. Shelby is a research scholar here at the Stanford Internet Observatory, where she studies comparative politics and disinformation in Africa. And she's been looking at the impact of uh, GPT-3 on disinformation. So Shelby, take it away. OK, cool. So I'm going to be talking about how foundation models, particularly GPT-3, will shape disinformation and the implications for human detection. Um, so to start off, I just want to describe like the status quo and some choices that uh, disinformation actors have to make when they are like launching a covert influence operation. So let's imagine that the government of Russia wants to reduce trust among Libyans in the Libyan peace process. And the particular narrative that they're gonna push is they're gonna claim that participants in the peace process are accepting bribes. So they have a couple of options when it comes for when it comes to how to implement this campaign. So first they could find Russians who speak Arabic in Russia to create content for like Facebook pages that are gonna push these narratives. Second, they could try to find native Arabic speakers in Russia. So maybe like a Syrian immigrant in Russia or something like that. Third, they could try to find native Arabic speakers in countries close to Libya. So for example, they could outsource their operation to like an Egyptian digital marketing firm. 
Um, and then finally, they could find Libyans who are in Libya to, to create this content. And none of these options are, are optimal. So for the first three options, it's likely that the Arabic is not going to be like the exact dialect that, that Libyans are used to. So you might think that the last option is is the best because you know surely Libyans are going to be best able to create content that would like resonate with other Libyans, but there are operational security issues here, and it's you know there could be issues with like managing this operation remotely. So how would GPT three kind of you know solve some of these issues? Well, so in some circumstances, the the quality of the writing would improve. So you know we already know that people can't really distinguish between text created by GPT two and humans. Um, though it's kind of unclear the extent to which like improving grammar matters, and I have some kind of co-authored research on that underway. Um, second, it would improve operational security because you would just need fewer people involved to implement this covert campaign. Third, the marginal cost of content creation would decrease. So we know that that last year, a uh, Russian oligarch paid American unwitting American freelancers to create articles for their disinformation campaign, um, and the the cost that was the amount that was paid to freelancers was up to two hundred dollars per article. So that cost would would go down. Um, it would allow for the ability to target at scale. So often disinformation actors want to push, want to achieve like one particular objective, but they want to customize their narrative for different audiences. And that can be really time consuming. And GPT-3 would, would allow for that targeting at scale. Um, and then finally, GPT-3 will make it harder harder for researchers both to identify these campaigns in the first place and second to measure their reach. And I'm going to give two examples that talk through this, this last bullet point. Okay, so uh, the first example is, this is a real thing that happened. There was a disinformation campaign attributed to Russia's military intelligence that pushed pro-Russia narratives on Syria. And so the way they did this was they created this fake think tank called the Inside Syria Media Center. And the way it worked is uh, this fake think tank had like these totally fake uh, citizen reporters who claimed to be like on the ground in Syria and they were going to, you know, tell it like it really is. Um, and so these kind of fake personas would author articles on Inside Syria Media Center. And then within like 48 hours, that article would get reposted on dozens of sketchy websites. Um, so this is like one example of a repost on a weird website called Activist Post. Um, so yeah, that was kind of how the how the campaign worked. So how would GPT-3 have changed this campaign and, and our, our research process? So first, the writing would have been better. The quality of the writing for this campaign was so bad, the point of the articles was sometimes not even clear. And you can kind of see it from this headline here, though the headline is generally not that bad. Like I think it should be Human Rights Watch conducted a biased investigation into the school bombing in Idlib. Second, it would have made it much more difficult for, for me and my co-authors to identify kind of how far this these narratives spread. So basically what my co-authors and I did was we took, there were 2,000 um, original articles to the Inside Syria Media Center, and we basically just took random sentences inside the article and copied those sentences into Google with quotes. And that was how we found all the websites that the articles had been reposted to. And so with GPT-3, we wouldn't have been able to do this because the disinformation actors would not have reused the same text. Um, and then finally, it probably would have lowered the cost though. In this case, we don't actually know how much the operation cost. So I'll give one more example. Um, so this is an operation attributed to uh, a Russian oligarch that was targeting people in Libya. And one of the objectives of this disinformation campaign, uh, so there were these, at the time of this campaign, there were these two Russians who were in prison in Libya on charges of political interference. And so one of the objectives of this campaign was to make it seem like ordinary Libyans didn't actually want these Russians in prison. Um, and so this is like one uh, one tweet from, from this campaign. It's from an account that's been suspended called Noor Albarsi, and she was kind of pretending to just be an ordinary Libyan, expressing her opinion on this issue, saying that, you know, by kind of keeping these Russians in prison, it's going to be really bad for Libya's foreign relations. So we should just release them. And so the way that my 
colleague, Khadija Ramali, discovered this operation was she's Libyan and she was just on Twitter and she saw a tweet about these, these Russian prisoners. And there was just a phrase in the tweet that didn't seem supernatural. Like it was grammatically correct, but it didn't seem in line with the way Libyans had been talking about these, these prisoners. So she literally just copy and pasted that phrase, put it into Twitter, and then found a dozen other Twitter accounts that had used the same phrase. And the accounts had other similar attributes as well. And then from there, she just Googled the names of the Twitter accounts and found a really large Facebook presence that this operation had as well. Um, and Facebook had actually simultaneously discovered this, this operation, maybe in some other way, I'm not sure. Anyways, so how would GPT-3 have, have changed this? So first, it would have just been much more difficult for us to identify the influence, influence operation in the first place because we discovered it just based on this phrase that was being used repeatedly, and you wouldn't have to reuse language in that way with, with GPT-3. Um, and then second, again, probably the cost would have been lower. Um, and so I'll just wrap up with... Uh, kind of one open question that I think is interesting, which is how much curation is it reasonable to expect for a foreign disinformation campaign? So um, when researchers kind of study, you know, the whether people can distinguish between GPT-2 and GPT-3 and, and human text, people make different assumptions about curation. So is it reasonable to think that a foreign actor would like run GPT-3 X number of times and pick the best output, but then who would be picking the best output? Would it be a a native speaker or a non-native speaker? Um, would there be grammatical editing or other types of editing? And if so, who would be doing that? And I think thinking through that, that question is interesting for thinking about the implications of GPT-3 on disinformation. And I'll stop there. All right, thanks Shelby. Really eye-opening to see the role of LMs in these operations. So let's move on to our final talk by Katie Creel. Um, she's a postdoc researcher, uh, a research fellow of philosophy at the McCoy Family Center for Ethics and Society and an embedded ethics fellow at Stanford High. Katie's work explores the moral, political, and epistemic implications of machine learning as it is used in non-state automated decision-making and in science. Katie, please take it away. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Percy. Uh, excited to be here. So I'm going to build on uh, the previous talks by our previous three uh, presenters in this panel and talk a little bit about a additional problem uh, in addition to bias and misuse that we might think is um, caused by the increased adoption of foundation models. So this problem is the uh, homogenization when these models are used at scale. So in his introduction, Percy talked about homogenization of method, namely the way that foundation models can consolidate methodologies for building machine learning systems across a wide range of applications. But we also might wonder to what extent will the use of foundation models consolidate outcomes, namely uh, standardize outcomes in contexts where foundation models are used and where their adapted derivatives are used. So first, I'm going to talk about causes of homogenization. So I'm going to identify three possible causes, namely the same organizations and people building models. So this is something that Dr. Mitchell talked about. Uh, the same model um, being used in the context of different adapted derivatives and the same data being used to train different models. So first, uh, let's think about the same organizations and people building models and how this might concentrate control and power. So training of the large, largest foundation models currently requires computational resources that put their development beyond the reach of all but a few organizations and institutions. And access to computational resources and data will continue to determine who is able to produce these kind of cutting edge foundation models in the coming years. Um, this centralization of power raises concerns about the ability of currently marginalized people and communities both to participate in the development of foundation models and shape them for their ends and for their goals, uh, and also to audit and contest them. And especially within the realm of government services, ad adoption of foundation models could further transfer decision-making powers from governments to corporate service providers and introduce additional barriers to due process and accountability. So uh, a second issue is this fundamental picture we have of foundation models. Namely, we have uh, data that's used to train a single foundation model 
that's then adopted for many tasks. Uh, and the question is, does this process, this single foundation model, then create a single point of failure uh, when it's used in, on all these tasks for all these adaptive derivatives? Um, and finally, another standardizing force is the shared use of data. So previous data curation efforts have standardized training corpora, and in doing so, standardized errors, such as the reliance on spurious cues and shortcuts, like background textures, to predict foreground objects. Uh, so here you have um, the high confidence cl uh, classification of a fox squirrel as a sea lion and a dragonfly as a manhole cover due to the similarity of the background textures. And so these standardizing efforts not only standardize these kinds of errors, but also increase the likelihood that biases will be standardized, as when face databases overrepresent males, light skinned people, and adults between the ages of 18 and 40. And so use of foundation models could exacerbate these existing trends in standardization of training corpora due to the massive scale of both unlabeled and labeled data that's needed. So to the extent that models train on similar data, they're likely to acquire similar patterns of behavior, biases, and errors. Um, and currently, many foundation models are trained on unlabeled corpora chosen primarily for their convenience and accessibility. For example, public internet data, rather than their quality, uh, the consent of people for their data to be used in the corpora, or the lack of personally identifiable information. So in contrast, carefully curated data sets like Eleuther AI's The Pile or many data sets in Hugging Faces Dataset Hub can increase the diversity of the training corpus and improve these kinds of outcomes, um, as well as their other benefits in modeling or encouraging documentation. Um, so research questions in this area include, to what extent will these three homogenizing forces end up standardizing outcomes in practice when their adapted derivatives of foundation models are used for automated decision-making or generation? But then uh, thinking about the last point, if standardizing architecture and data sets improves quality, is homogenization still a concern? So is it still a concern if there's this kind of consistency in the outcome? So uh, taking the ecosystem view, thinking not just about the model, but about the socio-technical system in which it's situated, what would make homogenization harmful? So let's take two examples. One is uh, automated decision-making. So individuals and companies or organizations may rank candidates for the same opportunities like jobs or loans by their own metrics. But if the same hierarchy or ranking is used across an entire sector or a geographic territory, it can end up setting the rules of interaction with that domain and monopolizing access to opportunities. And the worry here is that consistent exclusion of the same people can lead to a pernicious social hierarchy. Um, and one of the reasons this is a moral concern is that it uh, decreases autonomy. So if we think about autonomy as being the ability to make decisions about your life, to have genuine choices that you use to uh, shape the way your life goes. And if autonomy involves access to a sufficient range of varied alternatives for your life, then it wouldn't be a moral harm to be denied just one alternative or opportunity, such as one job or one loan. But the harm of exclusion from opportunities becomes of greater moral importance at scale. Um, once you're excluded from a significant range of opportunities, uh, that's what we call a threshold harm. And so if a model that produces a consistent outcome is used across a broad range of uh, employers or lenders or other kinds of uh, people who control opportunities that significantly affect lives, this could standardize the outcome and wrongly exclude the same group of people. Uh, so monopolies on opportunity can constrain autonomy in a morally troubling way. And when a significant limit on opportunity lacks justification, uh, such as when it stems from an arbitrary correlation in the model, that's when we're gonna be concerned about it in a moral sense. So second, let's think about homogenization in generation. Um, so the worry here is that uh, by encoding a sort of standardized set of common knowledge, um, 
foundation models might encode what's sometimes called the view from nowhere. So uh, Alice and Adam talked about this in uh, the context of good old fashioned AI and knowledge databases and corpora like psych. Um, so here the worry was engineers sort of manually inputting common knowledge like you are not likely to get a speeding ticket in mid or late 20th century America if you're driving less than five miles per hour over the speed limit. So this is something that's true for some people and some identities, but not true for all people. And so by situating this as common knowledge, the engineers sort of encoded this, this view from nowhere that didn't acknowledge the situatedness of that perspective. So to what extent will foundation models standardize perspectives and present common knowledge when they're used for question, tasks like automated question answering or beliefs that encode this kind of view from nowhere rather than multiple diverse perspectives? So in conclusion, uh, homogenization is not inevitable. So as model, model developers intentionally broaden the range of perspectives that are represented in their data sets, we need more research on the capacity of foundation models to deliver a diversity of perspectives when used for generative tasks and a diversity of outcomes when used for automated decision making. So how can we build foundation models that can support a diversity of contextually adapted and situated derived models that are adapted to the needs, goals, and perspectives of diverse communities. Uh, thanks very much, and thanks to my co-authors who are listed here, uh, and I welcome your questions over email. All right, thank you, Katie. So let's now do Q&A. Um, so Katie, James, and Shelby, um, turn on your, your video and we can do some Q&A. Um, so let me begin. Um, James and Shelby talked about two distinct types of risks. So James talked about how um, perhaps you could call it an unintentional risk um, where models are kind of biased. Um, and this seems you know, hard to fix. And Shelby talked about kind of intentional uses of GP3 where it's not so much about bias. I wonder how these two might kind of interact with each other and perhaps compound. There is maybe a feedback loop where um, this information may be not launched by necessary you know, political actors at the, at the scale of you know, Russia, but similar uses of this technology could even amplify or accelerate the amplification of um, the, these biases. So either of you, if you have any thoughts on that. You want to go ahead? Go Thank you. Go for it, Shelby. No, go for it. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I think it's a it's a interesting question. Um, for example, when the models like we showed are have natural tendencies to associate the particular groups, like in this case, Muslims with, with violence, um, it is able to very creatively generate, I think, quite well written text right, uh, across very diverse settings that associate Muslims with, with violence, um, and I. I think there could be this feedback loop whereby you know, if there are if there are some bad actors that wants to spread the propaganda or misinformation to further propagate these stereotypes, then it will be relatively easy for them to use models like GPT-3 to create these stories because there are, as we showed, that even with relatively light prompting, the models already create very very uh, realistic stories of that form. Yeah, I'll just add that to the extent that misleading narratives are including included in kind of training sets that that can um, kind of further empower disinformation actors. So for example, like across the internet, there are already, you know, like so many articles that are um, kind of critical of Qatar. Like there are just a million Saudi disinformation campaigns that target Qatar. So, you know, when we play around with it, it's very easy for GPT-3 to create like misleading narratives of, of Qatar because I think that that stuff is like embedded. Great. Um, I have a question from the audience. Um, assuming that the harms of large language models can be mitigated, which there's little evidence for at this point, how do you ensure that they are, they are if industry has ultimate control over where and how these models are deployed and always in line with a profit motive? So maybe any of you could answer, just jump in. 
I can take a quick stab. I'd love to hear what, what, what Katie and Shelby have to say, but, but I think um, having some level of transparency is very important in the beginning, just to say, where are these models being used? And if, you know, if some a company has a lar large pipeline, it's important to know which part of the pipeline is actually either feeding into the model or taking output from these models. Right? So just that level of transparency uh, is quite important for building up some accountability. Shelby or Katie, do you want to add anything to that? I think this is somewhat outside my area of expertise, but um, yeah, the extent to which kind of actors who want to run disinformation campaigns can can access these models. I'm not a super expert on that. Great. Um, here is another question. So it does seem like scale has a particular prominent role. Um, so Katie mentioned how homogenization at scale is particularly troubling. Um, disinformation also depends on a certain type of scale. Um, so does this mean that uh, is scale the right thing to kind of focus on? And if, if so, are there things we should do to kind of regulate or control the scale in, in some way? Um, I will take a, a first pass and I would love to hear Dr. Mitchell's thoughts on it as well. Um, I think one, one way to think about that could be uh, what are the things that, that scale uh, may be required for? And if there are such things, um, how can we ensure that um, everyone has access to the generative possibilities, but also that um, the models that are made at this scale, which are likely to be fewer in number, uh, provably exhibit certain properties? And so that's why we focus in um, some of the ethics sections of the paper on auditing and uh, transparent access to uh, audits by independent uh, people who are not part of the company um, to sort of audit these, these large uh, models. Um, yeah, I mean, I can piggyback off of that a bit, um, but actually I, I think I see uh, scale as uh, not, not the most important sort of factor to focus on, but actually data. So arguably you uh, don't need to have as large scale models if your data is well constructed. I think that's an open question, but um, since everything that's feeding into the models and what's creating the need for the scale um, is around the data, I see that as, as probably the most uh, important area to focus on. Um, and then there's also the questions of what are we trying to achieve with the scale, um, which, I, which I guess uh, uh, Katie just sort of mentioned, right? So um, it's useful to think about what questions we, uh, we want to answer as we're building these models and what we might be able to do to better answer these questions. Um, so, you know, working on systems that can provide uh, more visibility into things like um, goals and values that are being picked up or actually being able to incorporate goals and values into model development. Um, I think these are key issues that scale sort of glosses over in the hopes that these will be figured out by scale. Um, but I don't, I don't think that's been shown to be true. And, and I think that a lot more work should be done on what needs to happen to have smaller models probably uh, that are more aligned with the sort of values we want them to learn. Yeah, I'll just add on the scale question. I think one of the things that I find so fascinating about the Internet Research Agency's disinformation that targeted the US in 2016 is how carefully they were able to customize narratives for particular audiences. So just to give kind of one example, one of the narratives they tried to push is that the US should get out of Syria. And they customized that narrative for black Americans saying that, oh, why is the US focused on problems in Syria when we have like, you know, clean drinking water issues in like Flint, Michigan. And then they customized that narrative for like people who supported Texas secessionists, secession. Um, and, you know, reading the post, it's just clear like how much effort and how much local context was required to to create this. And I think Russia is a little unusual. I think, um, you know, many, most disinformation actors that I study, like don't have the capacity to run a campaign like that. But I think the thing that makes me a little scared about GPT-3 is that it would give that capacity to, to kind of some of the more unsophisticated disinformation actors. Great. Um, let me take another question from the audience. Um, this one is, I have reservations about hand curating data for use in foundation models. 
Um, it could be used, misused by nefarious regimes. Sure, we can exclude certain parts of the internet or wiki when training, but how can we be sure someone doesn't train a model only on the data expressing opinions that fit theirs? So anyone could uh, jump in and answer this one. I mean, I can say that as it is now, we're training data on lots of prob problematic opinions. We just don't know what they are, right? So, I mean, one of the keys in developing things in ways that are more value aligned is to understand what are the values at play. And our current approach of just closing our eyes doesn't mean that really harmful content is being is being picked up. And actually it is. Um, and so, uh, so, so you know, we we all uh, we all need to think deeply about what our norms and values are, and then come to some sort of consensus within the organizations that are building these things. Um, but that said, like that does help us to actually, you know, um, create models that aren't going to pick up, uh, you know, problems just by accident, just by the fact that they're looking at lots of data. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I appreciate your reservations, but the other side of that is that there's already a lot of stuff at play. We just don't understand what it is. Um, and so better, better to understand. And just to briefly add to that, um, as you know, building, building on other things uh, in the, in the data section, it's not, it's not the case that the current use of large data is getting, you know, a perfectly naturalistic distribution of everyone's opinions out there. Which, which I think would be the argument, perhaps implicit in, in the question, that would be like, well, we don't want to change the naturalistic distribution of opinions. That's very much not what's being modeled by the data as it's gathered. And so you're not really losing that. Yeah, I'm also curious what Shelby maybe has to say. I mean, it seems like I would love it to be able to kind of be able to curate and kind of understand and manage the data. I, I do wonder if there's additional kind of a risk factor in the context of malicious actors uh, to be able to ha even have more, even more control or power in some ways. Yeah, I see the trade-offs. I haven't thought about this in, in depth, but um, I see the trade-offs in both directions. James, do you want to add something? Yeah, I, I, one comment, which is that um, I think in many domains and applications, it's very hard to know what is clean data or to curate what is clean data, right? Um, you know, and even if one has relatively clean data, like we have done some experiments on taking relatively clean sub parts of Wikipedia and training these models, there could still be all sorts of creative ways that biases can, can creep in. So that's why I think it's in addition to think about the data side, it's also really important to think about at the other end to systematically audit and to test these models and with probes, with human in the loop process. Cool. Um, we have another audience question. So in part, we focus a lot on data. Um, there's also the transformation of data to learn models. So to what extent does that um, have a role in kind of shaping the bias? And are there any sort of model specific interventions that we can do to help um, mitigate, mitigate bias? Yeah, I mean, there's there's been a lot of really cool work on this. Um, so, I mean, um, a lot of the the amplification of different kinds of biases is a is a function of your objective function, right? So, thinking critically about what this should be and what you're trying to incorporate is really important. Um, and then, you know, when you're thinking about uh, your objective function or your loss function, you can play around with that um, and do lots of really cool things to help mitigate bias. So, you know, uh, one of one of the basic approaches is sort of like an adversarial uh, multitask model where you um, uh, where you basically uh, invert the gradient that is able to do sort of more problematic things and then uh, allow it to focus on your your core task. Um, so using these kind of multi-headed models allows you to, to do a lot of really fun things with bias mitigation. Um, and there's been, you know, um, more work on different kinds of pairing techniques you can do in the loss function. Um, there's a lot of, you know, really cool stuff there. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's an open playing field with a lot of potential. Yeah, great. It seems like we have to act on all levels, both the data and, and the model. Um, so unfortunately, we're out of time. So uh, I would like to thank the, the speakers like, once again um, for the, the wonderful talks and the discussion. Thank you.
Um, now I, we want to move to the final panel. So I'd like to invite Rob Rich um, to moderate the panel. Rob is a professor of political science at Stanford. He's also the director of the Center, of Eth Center for Ethics and Society, co-director of the Center on Philanthropy and Civil Society, and an associate director at the Stanford um, High. So Rob, welcome. Thanks very much, Percy. Um, all right, well, we're coming to the tail end uh, of our two-day workshop. And uh, we're gonna continue many of the themes that we've just discussed for the past hour or so. And I wanna welcome to this wide ranging discussion for this final session, um, someone we've already heard from, Dr. Meg Mitchell. And I want then also to introduce our three other discussants. Um, Dr. Angel Christ Christen is a colleague of mine of ours here at Stanford University in the communication department. Um, she has a fantastic recent book out um, about algorithms and the contested meaning of their deployment within journalism and other um, um, places, other workplaces, metrics at her work. We'll also be joined by Dr. Sarah Kreps, who is the John Wetherill Professor of Government and the Chair of the Department of Government at Cornell University. Her work brings together an impressive array of themes in um, international politics, technology, and national security. Um, I'll be especially curious for some of her reaction um, to the presentation about disinformation that we heard um, just before from Shelby Grossman. And finally, we'll be joined by Dr. Samir Singh, who is an Associate Professor of Computer Science at UC Irvine. His work centers on trust in machine learning systems and especially matters of robustness, interpretability, and explainability. All right, so if we could all uh, join together then in a discussion, I just wanna begin with a kind of, I guess, framing remark, uh, which is having now listened to a day and a half worth of conversation, in particular, um, taking the cue from your presentation, um, Dr. Mitchell, uh, I'm going to give a kind of, you know, um, unbelievably condensed summary for just a moment of what I'm what I'm taking away after the past um, um, hour and a half in particular, which is that um, large language models and foundation models, as we've described them, described them here in this in, the, in this white paper, um, are built on um, un, um, un, uh, uh, unconsented data. Uh, they run the risk of per, uh, perpetuating or exacerbating bias and stereotype and discrimination, all of which amount to the um, imposition of harms on actual human beings. Uh, they bear the risk of not merely unintended forms of, of harm, but also quite intentional forms of harm in misuse or malicious use cases, the disinformation campaigns, for example, that we heard from uh, Shelby Grossman. And then um, um, uh, Katie Creel's presentation alerted us to the idea that even if we could imagine that these language models were working in a way in which we felt we were doing the very best we could to mitigate some of the problems, the idea of homogenization and standardization might um, um, be an all things considered detriment to the uh, desirability of pluralization and the ever contesting and growing use of language um, in, um, in, in, a, in our world and in our human communication. All the more so because, of course, as we began this conference describing, um, these models currently are being built almost exclusively within big tech and within industry, so they amount in that respect to a concentration of power there as well. In other words, I come away from this discussion, and as I hope you are, um, hugely disturbed. And uh, I think we should just address all of the, uh, you know, quote unquote, downsides head on to begin with. So, um, Dr. Mitchell, if I can, just to begin with you, uh, and then I want to turn the floor over to, the, to the, the, the new voices as well, uh, and especially invite your own distinctive expertise into the conversation. Um, I believe it was uh, mentioned in, in the introduction that Percy gave of you, Dr. Mitchell, in your keynote, but in case I, I missed it, um, it was just announced this morning uh, that you're, you're joining Hugging Face. And um, in light of the comments that you and others have made on the panel, um, and perhaps with an eye toward understanding from my point of view, that announcement about your joining Hugging Face, one of the things that you presented was the idea that we should not take the, the existence of or the de development and deployment of these models as an inevitability, that we, we can contest them for sure, um, we can refuse them, um, we can find ways to block them, perhaps. And uh, what I'd like to hear from you is, perhaps in light of the announcement about Hugging Face how, and, and your past employment, of course, at, at Google as the, the founder of the AI ethics team, um, 
what do you think of the case on behalf of deploying um, language models and continuing to develop them? And I'll, I'll add just one small footnote to that, which is I think that um, we're agreed, although I want to leave it as an open question because I'm not sure, your remarks at the start contain some direct criticism of HAI and its own um, kind of orientation as a human-centered institute. Uh, my own view, putting it on the table, is that my own interest as a, someone with philosophical training contributing to HAI and to the um, um, team with Percy and all the many others whose names are on the white paper starts from the premise that hot housing technologists alone in the laboratory and then allowing social scientists and humanists only once AI has been released in the wild to enter into the conversation is not a healthy recipe for steering the benefits that we hope from technological advancement uh, for so social benefit as well. And so better, we think here at HAI, create an interdisciplinary environment in which people all together sharing interdisciplinary perspectives um, can find a way to contribute to the forefront of the development and deployment of these models. Of course, we've also discussed how difficult that is to carry out within academia, and that's part of the project here. So um, what's the case on behalf of language models, and, and how, how do you think about your own contribution to ensuring their beneficial social use cases rather than all of the hugely disturbing things we've heard in the past 90 minutes? Yeah, th thanks for asking this. I was thinking that you'd probably ask something like this. Um, so first, uh, I want to address these ideas of um, uh, around blocking language models and, and this idea that people should be refusing. Um, my argument here is that there should be space for refusal, right? So treating language models uh, or calling them foundation models puts forward this idea that this is a thing that should be worked on that influences what people are going to write in their PhD theses, right? That's going to influence what people get tenure for. Um, these are all these, you know, implicit things that happen when you start centering language models as having these fundamental benefits and something that everybody works on. You know, it creates a norm around building and developing language models. I think the thing that I take objection to there is that it doesn't leave space for the more socio-technical questions around it, people who are actually really interested at looking at uh, things that are not uh, language models or, or different kinds of alternatives to language models, right? Um, bringing in the effects uh, that can help of participatory design and value-sensitive design and all these other things are, you know, that's all sort of sidelined as we center language models. And the idea is that there should actually be more space here for people to feel included and, and understand that all of these things play a role, including, um, you know, deciding not to work on these things. Don't reject papers, right? Because they're, um, because they're, they're not having an appropriate focus on language models or objecting to them in some way that you disagree with. Um, it's about making a space for these other kinds of, of views um, and and expertise areas. Um, around uh, blocking um, language models, I think yeah, your question there is missing a bit of nuance. So uh, there might be cases where um, uh, not allowing use of a language model makes a lot of sense. There might be cases where a kind of limited use of a language uh, might make a lot of sense. Um, there's a lot of kinds of issues, or there's a lot of kind of situations where you could imagine that you want a little bit more interaction between the model developers and the people who are deploying the model. Um, so I don't think casting um, my desires or maybe other desires of, you know, people who are like friends with me and stuff as a desire to fully block language models is quite right. There's a lot more nuance, nuance there about how they're made accessible. Um, and the kinds of things you want to put in place. Um, your other, your, so your second question then um, was uh, given um, that I'm that I'm at hugging face. What what do I have to say about that? Um, so personally, I find language models fascinating, um, and I like working on them. Um, and so you know, 
Uh, given that hugging face already is aligned to some pretty critical ethical values around transparency, around collaboration, um, around uh, responsible data governance, um, around uh, detailed documentation uh, of both data sets and models, it seems like I have a lot I can add to help further you know, people who are really interested in working on these things down a more ethics informed value value aligned kind of path. It seems like a almost kind of like the exact right place for for me to be in, given given my interests and what I'm trying to do with AI more generally. Um, and then your third point was around HAI and interdisciplinarity. Um, again, it's it's I think there's a little bit of nuance there that might be missing. So it's not that interdisciplinarity is bad or that it's like not worth mentioning as, as something that's great in the HAI. Um, my point around there was, uh, was the need to have um, a more intentional analysis of what the diversity is of the people who are there. And here I'm talking about race, right? Um, here I'm talking about ability status. Here I'm talking about age. So interdisciplinarity, I agree, is absolutely important. Uh, diversity um, and around power differentials, um, I would argue, might be even more important. Um, so, you know, yay for saying interdisciplinarity. We could do a lot better. Mm -hmm. um, I think those are your three Yep, that, that was super helpful. All right, um, we've got three new voices that get into the conversation. So um, just going in order of introduction, uh, Dr. Kristen, I just want to invite you to, to comment you know, on any of the past 90 minutes, but putting in the foreground, if, if you might, some of your own work in the, the use of, of algorithmic tools of measurement and you know, the deployment cases within journalism in the workplace, which have been the focus of your research. Of course. Um, so thank you so much for this invitation and thank you everybody for the great presentations and the, the interesting discussion. So I come to this question um, trained as a sociologist um, and as an ethnographer and specifically an ethnographer of work and organizations. And so um, one way in which I come to this debate um, is, so okay, a distinction that I really like is the difference between critical approaches with a big C and critical approaches with a small C. Mm -hmm. So critical approaches with a big C, um, which we've heard a lot about, I feel, over the past two, two days, um, you know, are basically comparing uh, what's happening to um, abstract and normative principles. So typically talking in terms of harm, of fairness, of justice, of bias, um, you know, and comparing kind of what's going on to these kind of normative approaches. Um, within sociology uh, and kind of anthropology as well, we tend to think of ourselves more as a small C critics, um, meaning that we compare these big kind of principles to what's actually happening happening in the real world, right? To like actually existing institutional processes. So why does this matter? This seems like perhaps a long meandering introduction, but one thing that I'm concerned about um, when we talk about uh, foundation models or large language models is that, you know, we've heard again and again and again that they are, might be, perhaps will be, probably will be, actually will be and are already harmful. Now, what's interesting is that we hold these kind of questions about like all the harms, actual and potential, with the fact that these models are going to be developed. They are getting used. They are out there. So how do we hold these two things together? And one thing I'm wondering, I'm, I'm kind of um, a bit um, uh, scared of is, uh, you know, what has emerged in the literature as a question of ethics washing. That we just kind of say, oh, it's so harmful, it's so bad. And then we just do business as usual and continue exactly uh, had, as we had always intended uh, and just kind of, you know, uh, talking about ethics in a footnote or, uh, as some people mentioned, uh, at the very end of um, a two-day conference, uh, even though it has been kind of um, repeated over and over um, over the past two days. So uh, one thing I will say is that from my perspective, what's really interesting is what are the organizational processes what are the institutional forces that we can put in place to make sure that we take into account these questions more than this kind of um, ethics washing kind of approach, right? And I think that this raises questions not only about, you know, the questions that we've talked about, about 
Um, being very careful about the data that's being collected, that's super important. Being very careful about the parameters, again, the model construction, uh, being very careful about the funding, being very careful about all of these things. Um, all of these things are very important, but it's not enough to say that they're very important. What's really important actually is to implement them in uh, ways that are reflected, not only in the inclusion of diverse forces, but also in the governance of these diverse voices. So one question for example that they have is that if there is a disagreement about the directions that a given foundation model or large language model, whatever you want to call them, uh, is going, who gets to vote? Mm -hmm. Whose voice is that included? What about people whose data is being collected? Is there a way of including them? We all say that we want um, affected communities to be part of the debate. What does it mean to say affected communities? How do you define communities? How do you engage them? How do you make them part of the discussion? And I think that here, you know, I mean, um, I, I take into account uh, Dr. Mitchell's comments about, about Stanford and, and HAI. Uh, I think that in many ways, um, it's not enough to say that academia is going to do things differently from industry. Uh, in many ways, Stanford and Google have more in common uh, than, say, Stanford and the community college, right? And so I think really the question is, so how can we do this differently, looking at these questions of governance? looking at these questions of justice, looking at who gets to make decisions, who is included in the decision process, and how do you make these changes concretely? And again, um, I say that as um, an organizational sociologist and an ethnographer, uh, being really interested in how organizations address these questions of fairness, accountability, transparency, and ethics, and how to really implement them deep down into the kind of nitty gritty details of daily life in the organizations. Um, and I think that uh, when we analyze uh, there, when we think about foundation models or large language models that have like all of these emergent uh, characteristics, this kind of scale characteristics, all of what we talked about, uh, these questions of implementation become particularly tricky and complex and are gonna take a lot of time and effort. Um, and so perhaps I'll stop there. Um, yeah. That's the rest of the discussion. Thanks. Thanks very much. And and um, if, if if you'll permit, just a thirty second comment from from me as the moderator, uh, Dr. Kristen. I feel like you're you're speaking in many respects a language I respond to naturally. Um, the idea of governance, who gets to decide, the inclusion of voices of an affected community, and um, I'll introduce just for the sake of perhaps seeding uh, further conversation a concept which I don't believe has come up yet in in our day and a half of workshop, which is. If these models are as powerful at accomplishing language um, generation as we already know them to be, and it can continue to expect them to grow, what would make the decisions hot housed inside a company, large or small, legitimate when we know and can predict in advance the impacts they're going to have? So, how do we confront the question of legitimate decision making um, given the scale and performance of the models? All right, Dr. Kreps, I'd love to get you into conversation now. Um, perhaps the most obvious connection I'll invite you to comment on is the presentation by Shelby Grossman that kind of um, opens up for us a geopolitical contest, um, or at least context in, in the use of these language models, a new, a new front within geopolitical battle. Um, this has been some, some focus of, of, of your work, but of course, there's plenty of topics on the table for reactions um, as well to anything else you wish. Please. Thanks, Rob. Um, and thanks to Percy for uh, organizing this amazing two-day workshop. I've learned a ton. I kind of, I, I was busy all day yesterday, but I binge watched like three or four hours in a row last night of yesterday's workshop. Um, and it was fascinating. Um, so I will just pick up on one of the, I guess, threads of debate, uh, Rob, that you and Dr. Mitchell were having. And I really appreciate that Dr. Mitchell followed up because, um, it seemed to me as I was listening to you talk, Rob, that there was maybe a false choice being presented between lionizing these large language models and blocking slash refusing them. Mm -hmm. And I do think there is a, a, a large space in the middle. Um, and that's the one where I think my work has occupied, which is um, the premise that these uh, the, the, the genie is mostly out of the bottle. There's not much um, way that we can easily block or refuse the models and that we should just better understand what their capabilities are when, um, if and when they're released into the wild. Um, and so I, as you indicate, Rob, um, have approached this 
from more the perspective of politics and international politics um, and the kind of 2016 election with interference from um, the outside. And one of the points that was made by the Senate Intelligence Committee was that these techniques will become more and more sophisticated. And so working um, with GPT-2 initially and uh, more recently GPT-3, I was wanting to understand empirically what is the impact of these models in a political context. Uh, and so we uh, need to understand what those impacts are to really kind of know where in that continuum between lionizing and refusing we should occupy. Um, and so I've looked at, at those um, through a, a series of, of empirical studies. And that's where I think coming back to kind of this interdisciplinary question, a lot of this is psychology and how different individuals in society interact with these models. Um, and they're different individuals and groups that we are interested in, in a political context, we're interested in voters um, and how these models might be able to manipulate uh, public opinion. Um, we're also interested in legislators. Um, and so we've done um, some field experiments where we generate uh, messages or constituent emails and send these to uh, members of Congress. And, um, and, and uh, I'd be happy to talk more about those results, but what, one of the things we've found is that it's actually not that easy to do and uh, at the legislative level. And one of the reasons for that is that a lot of them now at this point in 2021 are pretty well trained, um, at least their staffs are, to know kind of what some of these attributes of uh, inauthenticity look like. And it's hard to do this in a sort of astroturfing kind of way, which is what you would want. Uh, in one constituent email isn't going to do anything. What you would need to do is use the features of the scalable aspects of these models to kind of inundate the staff. Well, the, the staff kind of know what's going on in most cases we found. Um, and so they're also, I think, attuned. One of the things we found in the early work of GPT-2 was that there were, and this is something I think we see in a political context that I think maybe is less visible perhaps in other contexts, that there would be little factual errors that were wrong about someone's committee that they were, the committee that they were on. And someone who studies political science will know that that committee name is wrong. Um, but most people we, uh, we interrogated or that we investigated in this um, experiment were um, a little bit, um, I guess, lazier. And they would cite things like, well, the article cited data and there was supporting evidence, even if that evidence wasn't correct. And so one of the things that has led us to be um, concerned about, again, in sort of this broader context of how should we understand these models and their, in this case, political impact, is that uh, there is a real potential for the ability to, to, to manipulate public opinion in part because uh, most people don't can't identify uh, those kinds of errors that you might see um, as outputs of these models. So I guess um, where I would kind of come around to uh, is this idea that uh, we shouldn't necessarily block them, we should understand them. And it's both a theoretical question, but it's also an empirical question that we're trying to understand from the interdisciplinary perspective of political psychology um, intersecting um, with the technology. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, I, I think that provides a very nice bridge to um, bringing you into the conversation, Dr. Singh. Uh, one of the things which it has been lurking behind many of the, the, the topics of just the past 45 minutes is, is trust. On what basis should either a developer um, of these machine learning models or um, uh, someone who's uh, subject to them, whether or not, whether knowingly or not, uh, uh, not perhaps not understanding that they're encountering um, a machine generated output of text rather than a, a human generated output of text. Uh, you've been working on trust for a long time. Do we have any good, good reason for thinking that with respect to the development of these powerful language models, um, the, the general public, or for that matter, developers, um, should trust the, the sense in which these will be developed responsibly and deployed in socially beneficial use cases. Yeah, thanks, Rob, and thanks for inviting me to the panel as well. I think what I want to say about that is there are maybe pathways to get to a point where you can um, you can come up with a methodology where you know whether to trust this or not, but it doesn't seem that we are on that path right now. Um, so I think just in general, the way these models are evaluated, especially when you start ascribing you know, foundational models as a term to them, um, then you have to be really careful about defining what makes them 
foundational as opposed to being any regular machine learning model. Even mm -hmm. if it's a language model, what's the difference between a foundational model and a non-foundational language model, right? And so historically, you know, if you think about where these language models are coming from, they're coming from the rest of machine learning and NLP where your evaluation is purely empirical on some held out data and being good on average is good enough for whatever you want to do. Uh, that, you know, so, you look at the best the model can put forward and you're really impressed by that. And on average, if it looks good, you're satisfied. That kind of stuff doesn't really hold when you start talking about foundational models. Yes. Um, the, the worst case performance of foundational models um, is much more important than it would be for rest of machine learning and NLP. And what are the impacts of that? What are the consequences of that? Um, and if you think only about the average case or the best case, then it sort of leads to a brittle foundation to whatever you're trying to do uh, for, for AI going forward, right? And especially like there is no lack of concerns for the ways in which uh, these models can go, go off the rails. Um, and so I think the main sort of solution and also thinking about bringing concerns from a diverse uh, set of people is to kind of thinking, start thinking about what is either an evaluation or a specification that, that sort of makes, lang makes us think of language models as foundational models. And then what should we expect for a foundation model to satisfy before we can call something a foundational model? Um, if these are quantifiable metrics, that would be great. But even to start the discussion of like, okay, this is the minimum that would be needed for us to be comfortable ascribing that term, I think would be a good, good place to get started. All right, let, let me put a, a new question on the table for, for all of us here, thinking about the, the language that's been introduced to us um, by Dr. Mitchell and Dr. Kristen in particular about, about governance and, and, and how it is to think about regulating or steering, whether through formal legal and policy mechanisms or alternative mechanisms, um, the, the development and then deployment of, of models. Part of what I have in mind here, because this is in also addressed in the, the white paper um, that the team here released, is that in the absence of there being bright line political regulation as yet, it's, it's so, so early days, um, we might need to look to the arena of professional norms as a way to coordinate activities in a trustworthy sense, to use Dr. Singh's term, or um, thinking of Dr. Kreps and her work in international relations, because there's no single enforcement mechanism at the global level, um, a set of professional norms happen to be what coordinate the better interaction of states and state and non-state actors rather than simple anarchy. Um, uh, does anyone have a comment to make, whether it draws from the, the white paper or not, about what, what I'll at least provocatively offer up as my own observation of the relatively immature or not fully institutionally developed set of professional norms within AI science, which means there's something more like a Wild West orientation. If you can develop it, give it a try. If you can deploy it, find out what happens later. Where are we going to get a, a more coordinated and more responsible set of professional norms for the development of these especially powerful models. Dr. Mitchell, would you like to start? Sure, yeah. Um, I've, I'm not sure I know what you mean by a professional norm, um, but, but where my head is going when you're talking about this has to do with standards and norms around uh, deploying models and, and using models and what kind of, you know, restrictions we might all, you know, adapt um, as, as, a, as a larger community. Um, and I think this is where things like very rigorous evaluation and transparency are key. Um, actually, Dr. Singh has done some amazing work on uh, doing evaluation for different kinds of specific issues and really introducing this kind of idea of like um, evaluation as, as sort of unit tests. Um, uh, Dr. Singh can speak more to that. Um, but I think that uh, we're currently in, in a situation where evaluation doesn't 
receive the attention it, it rightfully deserves. Um, we don't. We often uh, don't put forward rigorous baselines in our paper. We often don't disaggregate. We often don't really motivate the metrics that we're choosing and why. Um, this is all sort of called default bias or anchoring bias. Um, but if we can really focus on understanding the model's performance as opposed to optimizing the model, uh, then I think that will help create more norms around what you're actually releasing and why why, what you're actually prioritizing and why, right? So when we start doing like disaggregated evaluation across different subgroups, suddenly things like power differentials matter <laughs> in the development of language models. Suddenly gender matters. Suddenly all these you know, ways that disproportionate harms can affect different subgroups matter. Um, so I think a lot of the incentivization, incentivization and, and key there is, is around rigorous evaluation and, and uh, and transparency around all aspects of that. Um, I would hope that we would get to a point where people demand transparency about uh, different aspects of models and, and different aspects about how it works. Um, we're not there yet, um, but I would hope that by incentivizing, for example, by a best evaluation awards or you know these kinds of um, gold stars you can get for different kinds of, of behaviors when you're when you're publishing. Um, I think we could we could do a lot better at, at moving these things forward towards more preferable uh, professional norms, if that's what you meant by professional norm. Yeah, well, I'll invite Dr. Kristen and Dr. Singh and Dr. Krebs in here too, but just to specify at least what's in my head about professional norms. Certainly, the things you just mentioned, Dr. Mitchell, all count, but I would I would have perhaps even um, greater aspirations for things with things with not only carrots but sticks, some some teeth, where stigmatizing irresponsible um, um, or, or um, behavior or activity, things that fall shy of the professional norm that governs the profession. Um, Dr. Kristen's written about journalism and one of the ways in which the introduction of algorithms um, interrupted um, um, what had been um, not a, a, a sterling framework of professional norms, but a professional framework of norms within responsible journalism. Or think, at least in my mind, of biomedical research where there's an institutional review board, biomedical ethics as a well-built out scholarly field, ethics committees at all hospitals. And when the Chinese um, um, scientist CRISPR edits um, some human babies, he is promptly basically expelled from the community of respectable science, disinvited from professional presentations, not permitted to publish in any journal, any II paper, so far as I'm aware, can just be put up on archive, and there's no such thing as a professional norm that governs whether or not you're permitted to enter into respectable science within AI. So I have in mind those kinds of things with more teeth rather than just the carrots and incentives. Dr. Singh, would you like to talk about any of the issues that, that Dr. Mitchell mentioned with respect to trust and explanations? Yeah, I think she she brought up some really, really good points. The, the way to think about, you know, in, in terms of evaluation and, and what norms should a new foundational model that's uh, that's been introduced, what it should hold to. I think it, it's very difficult to dictate and specify and write down what that might look like, unless the whole community is sort of coming together to value certain, you know, like, for example, the reason we talk about GPT-3 is they, they evaluated on a certain set of data sets that we we felt at the time that were, were good reflections of what we wanted NLP to be doing, and that's we right. were wrong, but uh, but that's what we were doing. Um, and so I think uh, thinking about evaluation deeply, and I think the community is slowly moving towards there, where papers that are primarily evaluating other systems are getting their due. Um, and then when new models get introduced, they uh, will start adopting these available norms, so to say. right? Um, but one of the nice things about thinking about evaluation as the primary way to approach these foundational models is that it kind of frees up to a large degree the resource requirements. Um, of course, the, the foundational models themselves should be made a lot more available, like GPT-3 being behind a paywall still uh, is is a problem because there are a lot of questions you would want to ask, but you have to pay to find an answer to, and it shouldn't be that way. Um, but it does mean that universities and other resource constrained places can at least approach with like, hey, here's a data set that we would like to see, uh, we would like to pass, like to have a foundational model pass before we, we think that it's at, at all useful. Um, and, can and I invite you to be, Dr. Singh, perhaps um, if you have particular um, ideas in mind about what these background evaluative standards should be. So, so if we want to move beyond 
benchmarking performance um, as the, the be all end all of thinking about how to push the technological frontier. And instead, as Dr. Mitchell suggested, think of this as the, the, the technical accomplishment, but within a socio-technical context where we're evaluating the performance of the model, not as a mere technical achievement, but rather as, as it reflects an effect within a socio-technical context. What are the, what do you suggest as some evaluative standards for thinking about the performance of models within this broader set of ideas? Yeah, so that, that's a little bit difficult because I don't want to prescribe what those might look like. I think it's a discussion that sort of has to happen over time and, and sort of we have to agree on what that looks like. But I think from, from, uh, from a foundational model perspective, there are certain things we want to be able to, uh, for a model to do. And then there are certain things that we don't want the model to be doing and specifying them in as concrete of a way as possible um, is by, by concrete, I mean, almost quantifiable. That's sort of the first step to be able to do that. So we've been doing some work sort of not looking at foundational models, but sort of slightly more downstream models on essentially uh, creating a suite of tests that, um, that sort of check specific capabilities of these models. And uh, by having that suite, you can sort of figure out what are the capabilities and what are not the sort of capabilities of the model. Um, and so approaching things like that for, for the foundational models themselves is, is something maybe a good place to start with. But, uh, but that's just sort of the mechanics of how it will happen. I think where those cap list of capabilities or how to evaluate them comes from is sort of open to everyone. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kristen? Yes. Um, so, of course, as a recovering sociologist, like when you say professional norms, I just like, I write it. Okay, so the one thing to know, though, about professional norms is that they're not always necessarily um, uh, great for diversity, right? Like, so if you look at medicine, for example, the history of medicine, the professionalization of medicine towards a very strict kind of ethical and kind of normative canon also comes with the exclusion, for example, of nurses and other kind of um, experts that were all around. And, you know, typically professionalization comes with more exclusion and becoming even whiter, even more elitist, even more educated. So just putting this out there, that like professional norms in themselves uh, don't necessarily really do much. That said, uh, I think that in the context of computer science and engineering, um, there has been about the past five to ten years um, a lot of developments, and here uh, Dr. Mitchell has been such an important voice in that field and such uh, such an important force, I feel. Um, you know, data sheet for data sets, uh, model cards, um, uh, the development of um, fact for fairness, accountability, and transparency in machine learning. Um, so the development of new areas uh, within, uh, I feel, computer science and engineering that uh, not only uh, value, but also provide uh, concrete um, avenues for engaging in questions of fairness, accountability, and transparency. Um, so, so I think that definitely things are moving uh, kind of in that direction. Uh, now, the question is, uh, when you're talking about, you know, by example, foundation models, uh, I do feel that um, um, uh, so the fact that um, it, a lot of it has to do with downstream applications, from what I understand, uh, makes a lot of these initiatives perhaps a bit harder to implement. Now, the fact that uh, it may be harder to implement is not necessarily uh, in itself um, a reason not to do it or an obstacle. Uh, it just means that uh, there are opportunities for like kind of uh, development and ways of doing things a bit differently. Uh, one thing that I will say is that um, for a lot of these kind of um, norm, like uh, professional norms developments, uh, a big part, I think, of what needs to happen is the circulation of best practices across institutions, right? Um, and that goes back to this question of like diversity of creation or like, um, you know, um, uh, engaging against the concentration of power. Because if you only have one institution, whether a private or public um, or non-profit, whatever, um, that, um, that is building one model, uh, then you basically won't have this kind of like up and coming, like, oh, let's see what they're doing next door. And let's see if we can do the same thing. So typically, uh, if Google was the only one building um, large language models, and if, say, for some reason, they decided uh, not to document their processes, uh, that would kind of be the end of that, right? Whereas one could have, like, hope uh, in the context where, you know, you have Hugging Face, OpenAI, 
uh, now perhaps tenfold Google, Microsoft, etc. Is that like you will see a bit more of this kind of gradual adaptation of, of norms and standards uh, in kind of making these models more documented um, and hopefully more accountable. So that, that's uh, one thing I've been thinking a lot about in my work is looking at like kind of organizational barriers to like implementation of faith uh, value. Yeah. Dr. Krebs, maybe I'm stretching the analogy uh, beyond it, 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 its utility here, but if I think about the international arena, your area of expertise, one simple way of characterizing it is a, is a world in which there's some very large powers, a bunch of very small states, some non-state actors who try to exercise power, and a, a, a weak, at best, set of enforcement mechanisms for coordinating activity among state actors. Um, maybe that's not too far off the kind of situation we have within the competition in the marketplace of, of AI science on, on its frontier, a, a few very small, powerful actors, a bunch of startups, and some non-state actor equivalents perhaps as well. Um, how, how do you think, if you're willing to, you know, if you think the analogy is worthwhile, uh, feel, of course, feel free to reject it. Um, how does the, the analogy um, get, op, open up a kind of lessons from international relations about professional norms and coordination of activity for this Wild West frontier of language models? Thanks, Rob. Um, uh, you seem really proficient in IR, so I really appreciate you teeing this up. Um, so I would just say two things. Um, and one, they're, they're sort of adjacent to uh, international relations, but related. So the first is that the history of science is the history of technology leading policy. And what kept coming to mind, and this relates to my second point, is nuclear weapons. And that there was a lot of concern among the within the community that was developing them in the 30s and 40s. The, it, the sort of effect was demonstrated in 1945, but then it really took as uh, you know, time, decades, to coalesce around a community of arms control people that were able to actually implement something meaningful. And I think part of that is um, that new technology is not well understood. And so it comes back to my earlier point that we need to kind of understand the ecosystem and technology we're dealing with before we start to think about regulating. And I understand maybe that gets the causality wrong, that if it's a technology that has pernicious effects, you need to understand those ex ante. Um, but I think, you know, coming back to the post-2016 election, it was very clear watching these, uh, the testimony on the Hill in 2018, um, that these senators who are in a, in a sort of uh, government sense uh, responsible for regulating uh, social media um, really didn't understand the technology. I recall one senator saying, so how do you um, make money? And Zuckerberg said, well, Senator, we sell ads. And he didn't even kind of understand this business model. And so regulating something where the sort of lack of understanding was that sort of patently obvious, um, I think is clear why we, we weren't uh, getting very far until that, again, this sort of uh, what sort of prompts regulatory action um, is something where there's an overstep. And that uh, is you know something I'm reminded of Diane Feinstein's words to Zuckerberg, if you don't fix it, we will. And I think that, um, and Zuckerberg's comments of the, kind of back to your point, Rob, about, well, we're, we're more like a government than we are a company. Yes. And that's just an ex extremely um, audacious, but maybe not totally incorrect statement. Um, the second point, though, uh, is about sort of regulation. And sorry, first, one, one last thing on that first point, Please. which is that one of the reasons why professional norms have had to step in to the extent that they have is that these policies, the formal policy has been unable to kind of grapple with this. One of the so the second point, though, is um, about dual uses. And we've talked a lot about misuses. Um, but one of the challenges, I think, for the community is sorting out kind of the uh, beneficial uses of these language models, large language models, which are substantial from the misuses. And so how best to harness the positive without uh, um, sort of censure the negative without being unable to harness the positive. And yes. I think there again, we need to uh, better understand the technology and um, and its uses and misuses. Um, to, and, and, and this is why I think these professional norms are 
possibly more glacial um, than we might hope. Yeah. Dr. Mitchell, and then I've got two more topics in our last 15 minutes I'd love to address. Awesome. Cool. So I, I realized throughout this discussion that uh, your original question, uh, doc, Dr. Reich, uh, was hitting on things like uh, a code of conduct uh, or, or codes of ethics. Um, and so these are another place where we have uh, professional norms being defined around what you can and can't work on or what you should and should not work on. Um, and one of the really useful things here is now um, a lot of places are doing societal impact statements within their papers, um, mm -hmm. where a paper can be written rejected um, if it has foreseeable uh, negative effects that outweigh uh, the benefits. Um, and, you know, if you um, if you don't uh, follow the code of ethics or the code of conduct, you can not only have paper rejection, but you can have expulsion, right? So ACM has a code of ethics. Right. IEEE has a code of ethics. Um, yeah. And so to your, to your point about sticks, um, yes. Uh, the, these are the kinds of areas where, where you can do that, where it doesn't have to be some international thing. It's actually the actual publication venues. And so yes. if you're you know, expelled from all these uh, publication venues because you haven't stuck within the various codes of conduct, then you're going to you know, have a much harder time getting your ideas out, right? Um, and then the societal impact statements in particular are then useful for regulators because they're talking about the effects. So mm -hmm. regulators are not going to do very well at trying to regulate the behaviors within development because it's not necessarily understood how machine learning models are developed, but they can understand the po potential negative effects that can happen, the yes. sort of uh, the play, you know, how they can affect human rights and things like that. And so by starting to talk about the societal impacts, we're actually giving regulators a field where I think they can appropriately regulate, which is on what the effects uh, of these models can be. Yes, good. Thanks for that. And I'll add just one further example um, that comes to mind for me, which is that uh, here at, at HAI, we're piloting um, a program called the Ethics Society Review um, um, Panel or Inquiry, where any grant making internal for research purposes that HAI does, um, any grant applicant has to fill out an Ethics Society Review Statement um, where money could be in, in principle withheld um, for lack of attention to this exact domain. Um, we're collecting data on, on how this works and something that we uh, um, um, hope to uh, talk about uh, more broadly soon as well. Okay, I said that I had two more topics with the last now 14 minutes of our time. I'd like to talk about some of the trade-offs that have come to the surface in our discussion over the past day and a half, and especially just now, between desire for openness and transparency especially in the interest, as many people have said often about, about these powerful language models, that we can't even really fully understand the capabilities they have because they've been perhaps so, so tightly controlled by a small number of companies and their use cases or deployment um, cases are, are so unimaginably, unimaginably large. So there seems something certainly to be said on behalf of openness and transparency. On the other hand, as I began my you know, opening comment about this, the, the disturbing reaction I have to all of the bias and misuse and disinformation and malicious use cases makes me wonder, well, just opening these models up for anyone to give them a try is just inviting all of the things that this entire um, past 90 minutes of discussion have been at pains to foreground and make us concerned about. So maybe just to put a fine point on it, um, was, was OpenAI right to restrict access to GPT-2? Um, or now, as I understand it, it's behind a paywall and there's a limited um, access for APIs? Should anyone be able to access the language models of Anthropic or Google or Facebook or Microsoft or what Hugging Face is going to do? Dr. Mitchell, what want I start with you on that? Yeah, I realize that this is is probably a hot take, but I was very supportive of their decision uh, not to release the model um, and not to make it open for you know just sort of general interrogation from researchers uh, because of the foreseeable harms that it could create. Um, you know, you said this thing about um, anyone should we open it up for anyone uh, to give them a try with models? I think that uh, it doesn't need to be anyone, but it can be uh, case by case or just sort of general policies, right? So I worked on uh, uh, releasing face recognition through Google, but specifically for trusted media partners and then the other sort of uh, situation where benefits outweigh the risks is around human trafficking and you know identifying children who are kidnapped, right? So there are these specific kinds of agencies and organizations where it does make sense to allow 
to allow them to have more access than others. Um, and these are the kinds of nuances that you need to think through, I think, when you're making um, these, these models available. So, you know, the decision of OpenAI to uh, not make uh, their work um, publicly accessible across the board, I thought was was very much doing the right thing in, in minimizing the malicious uses that, that can happen. Um, whereas, you know, if they're working with specific kinds of partners and thinking through, you know, what are the benefits and risks, right? So maybe an academic institution that really wants to do research on what these models are doing, that might be a good place to give access. Um, there's like lots of caveats there, yes. um, as opposed to some general sort of unrestrained um, release. Um, so, so yeah, I I hear you on what you're saying, and I think transparency is uh, maybe best centered around uh, reporting things about the model, sure. um, whereas uh, the whole model itself, I think, needs to needs to be addressed with a lot more uh, nuance and care. Can I can I push just one one step further on that? Sure. Um, um, you said at, at Google, you you made um, if I heard it right, the facial uh, um, recognition. Tool. I didn't make it. Yeah. Uh, it, well, of, there was limited. Access access to trusted partners was yeah. was was the phrase. Yeah. Um, what's the framework for defining who's a trusted partner and who yeah. gets to decide what that framework is? Yeah, yeah. So in this case, trusted partners were ones who had consent from all the people who were being represented. Um, so media partners own the media, own the images um, of the people in their movies. Right. Um, and so that there was full consent sort of across the board where the actors signed the you know, gave the rights of their faces to the media company, and then the media company is consenting to use it on their, um, uh, use facial recognition, uh, you know, on their actual movies, right? So, so when we're talking about trust in media partners, we're talking about uh, partners that have full consent across the board, um, and who um, don't foreseeably have harmful uses that outweigh the foreseeable beneficial uses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, so that's the kind of thing, uh, we're talking about. And same thing for like human trafficking organizations. I would say that that's a place where, you know, specific kinds of face recognition is actually very valuable. Um, but you know, again, this is, this is a case by case kind of basis, specifically focusing on those organizations and those use cases where the foreseeable benefits outweigh the foreseeable risks. Yeah. Uh, again, I'll just insert something from my own experience here very briefly, which is that as someone with a background in political philosophy, having thought about democratic theory for a good part of the past 20 years, and over the past five years, wandering over to the School of Engineering side of campus here and beginning to interact and collaborate with, with, um, with engineers on a much more frequent basis, I sometimes hear the phrase invoked, how wonderful it is that AI is being democratized, in, which I take to mean something about how easy it is for anyone to pick up these extraordinary coding or programming skills and then to try to use these powerful tools for having an effect in the world. And although, of course, um, it will be no surprise that I value democracy as an ideal a great, a, a great bit, the idea of democratizing potentially dangerous and foreseeably harmful tools is not something to celebrate. We don't want to democratize the distribution of plutonium um, in order to explore the capability surface of nuclear energy. That would be a terrible idea. And we ought not, in my view, abuse the phrase democratization as a way of taking the positive connotations that go along with it to try to do something in the name of openness and transparency in AI science. All right, end of my little sermon there. Um, Dr. Singh, Dr. Krebs, or Dr. Christian, anything on this topic? And then I want to end on academia versus industry, which is sort of how this all began. Uh, can I go Dr. first? Dr. Uh, Singh, please. So yeah, maybe I'll disagree a little with, with Dr. Mitchell on this. Um, I think the... I think that there is a lot of nuance, so I, I don't think we should just release all the weights all the time. But the, the reality of the situation is that um, the weights do get reproduced in a matter of time. The models can be trained by people who have the resources. And what that ends up being, what, what ends up being the case is that people who have or institutions that have resources are able to replicate it. And if the model is not available for general inspection or interrogation, then uh, it ends up being the, the, the balance of who has access to the model really shifts, right? Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if this is a, uh, the, there is nuance and maybe there should be more empirical evaluation of like, does this actually stop as much harm as it would? Uh, but 
but yeah, like I can tell you my, my research is centered around inspecting these kind of models and the the time it takes to get access to these or the levels of access, even with even if you take away the money aspect of it, there are uh, aspects of GPT-3 access that my group would love to have that we don't have access to and we probably won't have access to. Um, and that prevents us from being able to interrogate many features. Right? And that's just, just, just our group. I'm sure there are lots and lots of people who have uh, really good thoughts about what uh, what passes for muster in these foundational language models, and they're not able to do anything about it. Uh, and so that that sort of how to trade off that with uh, malicious use, I'm not sure about. A lot of malicious use cases that we have looked at are probably ways that you can get around by uh, poisoning the data somehow or uh, doing something on a different model and trying to transfer some of those attacks. And then there are all kinds of things that can, can take place. Um, if you think about historically, GPT-2 was where the first conversation about withholding the model came up. And right now, I mean, as part of this workshop, I just read Mistral releases like I think, 30 different variations of GPT-2 and they're just openly available. So um, yes, we shouldn't release it immediately to encourage malicious use, but uh, maybe we shouldn't be too, too sort of protective of it either. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kristen. But again, I mean, I think that what Dr. Singh was just talking about um, kind of points out to the how important it is to have some kind of due process in how you get access to these models, right? So it's not only, so that basically like democratization is not a binary. It's not like nothing or all, right? It's not one or zero. It's instead like having like very clear principles that are decided upon by a kind of um, a diverse set of actors that all get decision-making power, then that are made public so that like people who are like, asking to get access to the data can get a sense of what are the principles that are being used to give them or not the access to the data uh, and then like having the ability to like appeal uh, yes. kinds of decisions and so so all of this is like I mean you know again as, a, as an organization of sociologist it takes time and effort and people to deal yes. with that and so it just means that like these questions have to be taken as seriously as the technology itself. And so I guess that, you know, like the good thing with technology is that it can scale and that's amazing. Um, and so I think that makes it very appealing. And, you know, there is obviously a technical appeal for computer scientists, but I think that this kind of organizational uh, and political aspect of who gets access, how, why, uh, with what kind of threshold uh, need to be also front and center of how, um, in the case of foundation models, but all kinds of models, I would argue, um, you know, we need to think about 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 these developments. Yeah, so w one bit about that. I just want to ask um, um, Dr. Singh, Dr. Mitchell, um, who, who who are doing so much work in this exact area. How close or how distant are we um, from such a framework that Dr. Kristen just described? A, a due process framework that's not just particular to a company about its decision for um, allowing access, but rather something that's a bit more shared amongst all of the different actors in, in the space um, trying to push the frontier on these models. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, and I and appreciate these points sort of distinguishing between um, allowing general inspection and then sort of case by case or, or more considered inspection. Um, I think that we could develop methods for this um, in a relatively short amount of time, but what we're blocked by is politics, right? So individual organizations, um, I should say like interpersonal politics or company level politics. Um, so individual organizations are not necessarily one, are, um, going to want to be the first to do this kind of thing, or they're thinking about who their competition is and how to get profit over that competition, um, or there are people who are already, already very entrenched in, in the sort of systems at the company already, and these are things that are not done, and so there's just going to be general pushback. Um, so while, like, theoretically, I think it could be, you know, somewhat straightforward to come up uh, with basic norms around this. Um, I think that the the blocker are people and and organizations pushing against it um, for reasons that have to do more with uh, profit or reputation. Yeah, Dr. Singh. I guess I will add that it's also not clear to me what the incentives are for these companies to participate in some kind of central set of uh, due process. I, I guess if there is 
uh, I, I guess I'm, I'm afraid if there is a lot of due process, they might just decide not to right. give access to people. And that that might be, yeah, that, that's partly the concern. I, I'll, I'll confess that I might have thought your answer might be the incentive for any company to do this is that it's in every single company's best interest that these technologies are trusted more widely. And unless there's some coordination, they might be less likely to be trusted. But um, um, I think we've pointed to um, something that leads us right into the final topic, academia versus industry. The political economy of the marketplace produces the very incentives Dr. Mitchell just described. It's a no company's immediate interest to somehow um, either decide to coordinate activity across other industry actors um, if it thinks that it has a model that's either going to bring it profit or, or you know, research status, whatever it turns out to be. So um, that goes back to, I think, the beginning of the two-day conversation, which is that in many respects, the foundation model effort here at Stanford is an attempt, um, again, to pick up the language, which we haven't talked much about now, but Dr. Mitchell gave us right at the start of the talk about power. Um, the power right now for the frontier of these models uh, rests almost exclusively within industry. And even amongst startups, the startups themselves are still in some sort of back-end way um, harness to the, the big tech powers. So as a, as a final conversation, I'd love to hear a bit from anyone here on this panel about leaving aside the fact that just as Dr. Kristen said, um, universities aren't themselves a monolith. There's community colleges and there's a place like Stanford, a research university itself with a lot of power without question. Um, I wonder, uh, uh, Jack Clark thinks it's essential in the talk he gave yesterday that academic or university actors also be meaningfully contributing to the frontier of development in this space. Um, we could also imagine, of course, civil society actors and nonprofit entities, and Anthropic is one of these kind of hybrid B corporations, um, so maybe occupies that particular space. Um, uh, what can we do, or maybe I should first start, do you agree that it's important that university and academia play a, a significant role, not just an observational and critical role in the frontier of the development of these technologies? And then secondly, how can we move from the status quo to that broader environment? Anyone like to um, volunteer to go first on that? I mean, I can go just because there's silence. Um, sure, please do. So, yeah, so I absolutely agree with that. Uh, academic institutions should be, be part and parcel of this. If for no other reason, um, then they have different incentives. Uh, yes. yeah, right? So the incentives of academics are not necessarily profit. Uh, you know, it's around like publishing papers and, and learning and things like that. And so having uh, complementary or interdisciplinary perspectives, um, you know, it's really critical in order to move these things forward in a, in a more well-informed um, and well-rounded way. In terms of how to uh, provide access for people across the board and in, in different institutions so that it's not just centered in tech companies with a lot of power, that's a little bit trickier. I would love to say that government can help, but I don't really trust government. Uh, I think we like to talk about regulation as if it's like this golden solution, but I think it's also important to realize that governments can be authoritarian, and, right? They can be very biased, they can be racist, so they're not going to necessarily have the better solutions. Uh, but clearly there's something in the sort of community-based um, space or, or philanthropic sort of space uh, where there should be be some sort of sharing of, of uh, uh, model training capabilities and things like that um, in order to allow uh, rigorous inquiry from academia. So still to be cited how to do that, but like clearly there's a need for that. Mm -hmm. Dr. Krebs? Yeah, no, right. So I was actually just, I was thinking exactly the same uh, initial point about incentives. So the incentives of an academic or academic reputation um, to, to, to do kind of uh, replicable work. And, um, and so what we want to do is, is publish studies that can be replicated and not have those retracted because, you know, that's sort of the worst thing that can happen to an mm -hmm. academic. Um, and, and the incentives for uh, sort of industry are, are quite different. And, um, but again, I guess I come back to my kind of initial point that it's, I don't think it's, I think it's a false choice to say it's sort of one or the other. I think all of these different entities should be doing uh, research into this, and they're going to come at it with different incentives and also different skill sets. Um, academics are going to be less applied, probably in some cases, 
more basic research um, that might then sort of feed uh, and seed the ideas for, for, for the more applied research that industry might do. So I think it's really about the partnership and the conversation and that through that, you can kind of triangulate and come up with the best solution. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kristen or Dr. Singh, any, any final observations or comments? I mean, I guess I agree that there should definitely be partnerships and again the the different incentives different skill sets all of them should 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 all come together the the mechanics of it like like dr mitchell brought up that seems very unclear to me um even incentives for companies to involve uh non-profits and and uh universities seems unclear so yeah how how it'll actually take place i'm more skeptical about but it will be great if it does yeah dr kristen any final remarks Perhaps. I mean, so, okay, I think that one thing that academic academia has going for it is that it has, you know, talking about due process, it has a pretty strong due process culture, uh, in part due to the history of peer reviewing, uh, the history of kind of hierarchical um, uh, norms in academia, etc. That said, academia is also a place of deep uh, elitism and exclusionary processes. So, you know, I'm not sure that uh, it's all it's all so great. But uh, one thing I will say in terms of incentives, and, and that's something actually that I've seen uh, looking at uh, the work that, that Percy has been doing over the past couple of months, um, is that the timeline is a bit different, right? Uh, there is more time. Um, and, and, you know, and, and looking again at like, you know, the effort that Percy, and here I'm talking about Percy, I know it's, it's a much bigger team, uh, yes. given the number of co-authors on the white paper, uh, you know, the effort that have been done to like try to engage in dialogue and kind of get um, uh, different kinds of opinions, which I think are uh, to some extent represented um, right now, uh, and, and, and uh, engage with uh, forms of critiques that go from like very mild to like uh, much less mild and kind of, you know, trying to kind of be comfortable with uh, different types of critiques. Um, I think it's something that comes with time and it's something that um, academic, academic can be, uh, in some cases, well positioned to um, handle. And perhaps I'll conclude on this point. Sure. Well, let me bring our conversation to a close with just the following observation and then a moment of thanks, which is that at least um, speaking personally for myself, one of the motivations I have to contribute um, um, to HAI is the idea that um, witnessing what I would describe as a brain drain of AI talent into industry, where, as the AI index has shown, more and more papers at the frontier of AI science are published from people in industry. Industry has an extremely important role to play. And yet, if the frontier is being plowed more and more often in a political economic environment where the incentives ultimately are for profit, um, I worry about the longstanding role of university-based scholars who aren't solely driven by a profit motive in their own research activities. And so if we can solve problems like access to compute, as well as data in many respects, the hope is that university environments can um, recapture some of the brain drain of talent that's gone into industry, um, speaking again for myself. All right, uh, I want to express my, my gratitude to Dr. Mitchell, Dr. Kristen, Dr. Krebs, and Dr. Singh for, for this final discussion of our, of our workshop. Um, thanks very much for your time and your expertise, and I want to turn the floor back over to Percy for final remarks. Thanks. Thank you. All right, thank you, Rob. That was an amazing panel. Wow, what a lot of great insights. I think I'll have to take a month or two to digest everything. I wanna thank all the speakers and panelists over the last two days for all their wonderful talks and discussions. We cover a lot of ground in a short period of time. Um, let me just try to cover some of the highlights. I probably won't get through everything, but we, we talked about the interplay of academia and industry at the, in the beginning of the first panel and also just in the last panel. This is salient because you know, the ability to train and work with these models is currently concentrated in industry. And we talked about the importance to improve accessibility, but maybe not full democratization to uh, lower resource organizations to do this critical research to shape the future of these models. We also need to be anchored in the practical realities faced by industry. We can't do this kind of in a, in a bubble. But what is the nature of this collaboration? How do you take into account all the different incentive structures here? 
we talked about how we need to set up some sort of governance or regulatory structure that enables the community to converge on these appropriate professional norms that are, I think, lacking by now. So we saw that these models are successful in various language tasks, of that, but we also talked about many other applications, biophysical simulations, art and creativity, scientific discovery, all of which could be incredibly enabling and quite different from the language models that you normally think about, which is why we termed the foundation models to capture something more generally. Interestingly, multimodality is, I think, a really strong strength of, of these models. And, but how do we think about interaction and grounding, which is important for a vision and robotics, and make sure that these are true foundations rather than just castle and error models? Um, how do we get these models to be more reliable enough to be used in industry? These uh, models learn in this alien way. Do we need explanations? Or are we OK with statistical guarantees? How do we make these more trustworthy and really center on humans rather than the technologies? And last but not least, we talked explicitly about the societal harms, how they perpetuate stereotypes, can be used for disinformation campaigns, lead ultimately to the centralization of power. There are many things we can do. Um, be careful about data curation, improvements in the core ML technology for bias mitigation. Um, but importantly, we also need to set up this governance structure, look at due process to include marginalized communities, the people who are creating the data, who may be not even aware of that the data has been used in a huge ML model. How do we make sure that their voices are heard? And how do we build ways to contest the decisions that arise from applying these models? So where do we go from here? Well, it's clear that these models have a lot of raw potential. And I want to emphasize that it's raw. It's non-finished. And they have a long way to go before they are really worthy as a societal or even technical infrastructure. But at the same time, these models are here. They're getting deployed widely. And so we need to act now. We need to get many voices, different institutions, different disciplines, people with different power statuses, all in the room, which we've attempted to do with this, this workshop. And we need to kind of act now and you know, chart out the, the, you know, the progress for the next next few years. So I want to end by thanking everyone who worked um, to make this workshop possible. First, my co-organizer, Rishi, who really helped both with the vision and logistic for the workshop, the high staff, Vanessa, Celia, Stacy, Shana, for helping getting the center up and running, um, the directors, Feifei and John Echmendi, for their continual support, and to the whole CRFM community, all the students, postdocs, faculty, researchers, because without all of you, there would be nothing. Um, I want to, again, thank the speakers and panelists, and you really helped bring in new perspectives, and I want to underscore the need for the whole community to get engaged. And finally, I want to thank all of you for joining us on this workshop. This is an incredibly important topic. Uh, if you missed any part of it, you can watch the full workshop. It's on the Sanford High YouTube channel. You can subscribe to the High newsletter for future updates. Um, and that is all for now. We'll see you next time. Thank you.